Okay, we're back for part two of the T55A. Uh, just going back briefly to the infrared side, it always has this cover on it. You have to unscrew, it actually takes a couple of seconds, but you're not gonna be doing this in combat on the fire anyway, uh, the retaining clips, and you can now reveal the searchlight. As you can see, it is a simple searchlight with a film, an infrared film, uh, on the inside of the lens, which is obviously uh, folded away for one reason or another. Very simple system, not the most uh, effective range, uh, a few hundred yards, uh, but certainly better than nothing or better than using your simple night vision sight without the assistance. But to recall what I was saying a little earlier about how Western tank commanders tend to fight open hatch, this is one of those cases where you really wish you were a Western tank commander. Okay, my legs are directly beneath the gunner's sight. That's bad, even for somebody with long legs. Now, my length has absolutely nothing to do with my width. I'm, in terms of width, a relatively narrow chap. And I am absolutely wedged in here between the recoil guard and the radio. Uh, to my front, the TPKU2B, it is a by five sight, uh, comes with a little choke range finder, replace an earlier by two model. For night vision, you could uh, pull it out and replace it with uh, an infrared sight. Little device here, I believe from tracing the cables, is an intercom switch. Once you're down here to see around, in addition to his by five, he also has two periscopes uh, in the in the hatch ring. In the hatch itself are two more periscopes, which aim pretty much off to one side or the other. He appears to have no rear visibility with the hatch down whatsoever, which is I'd, I'd call that a problem. Outside of that, to his left, as I mentioned, he does have the radio. Bear in mind that if this was a command vehicle, say T-55K, he would have more radios in here to give orders to various different levels of formation. One last comment about the legs. There is a footrest here, so it kind of flips up out of the way and my feet are on it. Absolutely mandatory. There is a uh, turret platform which rotates, good for the loader. The problem is that not everything in the hull clears where the turret platform would go. So as, I, as I'm looking down here, there is a cylinder of some sort which overhangs the turret platform by about this much. If my legs were hanging down and the turret traversed, well, there goes my foot. So one of the things that you're trained to do if a crewman goes down is go to a three-man crew position. So on the M1, for example, you have the gunner's sight extension and the commander's override. You can shoot from the commander's position. However, you're supposed to leave it at the high magnification because in theory, you can't reach the gunner's control panel. Now, I actually can just about do it. But to give you an idea as to just how close the gunner's seat and the commander's seat are, I am sitting in the commander's seat, my feet are on the gunner's footrest, and I can lean forward to the side and the controls, no problem whatsoever. You know, it's probably easier if you just do this as a three-man crew and get, and get it over with that way. So moving forward to the gunner seat proper, uh, my feet again are on a footrest and as mentioned, mandatory. The TC would have a little bit of room, I probably want to shove a bit further forward to put my head to the side. I um, mean, it's, it's actually quite a comfortable position, I guess. I mean, I don't know if I'd want to stay there in l for any huge length of time, but the one advantage to not having an actual basket and just having the platform is that when the tank is not in combat, and because I generally control the turret, I know it's not gonna swing, I can stretch my legs forward. I have all the room in the world. Uh, of course, in combat, not so much. Power traverse and elevation is by a fairly standard post-war control system. Unlike Western vehicles where the, uh, it's like a steering wheel to control direction, the Russian system is more of a turntable, but up and down is as you would expect. A uh, small problem for people who come over on exchange with the US Army, this is not the laser, this is the trigger. Uh, for those of you who don't know Abrams tanks, it's laser, trigger, 
uh, we had a Romanian exchange student come over and he went uh, laze boom, whoops. Uh, the laser was uh, the index finger, so it was uh, what you call a laze boom when you, when you try to laser target and then goes boom. Uh, all right, other features. There are manual backups, of course. There is the manual traverse. Very smooth, I have to say. Very well balanced turret. And the manual elevation as well, which also is extremely light and very quick. Uh, to go into a powered mode, there is actually a manual declutch. When I hit that, the, the entire gun breach moved. Let's see what happens if I try this again. Yep, it is now free floating and I can push the gun up and down. It shows you just how well balanced this gun is. In the meantime, let me put the clutch back into place. So now we are back into a geared status. Right. Controls for the main gun and coaxial selector. Um, there is a handle here to the direct front that has absolutely no use whatsoever that I can think of. I mean, it's just a fixed handle. Azimuth indicator to his left. He has three optics to look out of. For just daily view, he's got a Unity periscope. It's a by one. Uh, and it just gives him a broad view of the battlefield. Fairly nice. He has the direct vision scope and he has the periscopic scope. The periscopic one can be used for infrared. This is purely a daylight one. There are graduated scales for four different types of ammunition in the coaxial machine gun. This one is powered down so I can't see anything. To his left, uh, by his legs, are some of the uh, some of the rounds of ammunition. Uh, the ammunition is scattered all over the hull. Uh, the pan shot will probably get a lot of it. To his right, the D10 100mm rifle. Fantastic gun for its time. It has uh, range charts uh, for elevation marked on the side. So it looks like this is the manual trigger when your electricals don't work, just push down on this. I suspect this works in conjunction with this little uh, system up here, which as you slide back, I believe, recocks the firing pin. So if you have a failure to fire, uh, recock, hit the manual, hopefully that will clear your problem. That's about it for the gunner station, and I have to say it's very well laid out. Um, outside of the fact that it's really for small people, uh, this one definitely gets a passing grade. I, I have no complaints about it whatsoever. Now let's see what life is like over for the loader. So coming over to the loader seat, and uh, probably we describe in one word, ammo. Uh, so I'll start off with the seat that he's on himself. It's actually a very clever design. So it's in addition to being the sort of fold-up seat that you'd be used to, you stand up and it's spring-loaded, it folds away, you also have the option of moving it around. So you, you simply lift it out of these little hooks and there is an additional place if for some reason you want to be seated in a different location, maybe you're a different size or something. Let's try putting it right around. And you can put it here, and you can sit down facing to the front. Now, I don't know if loaders would have preferred to load sitting down or standing up. Um, there's arguments both ways. Either way, he has a lot of ammo. Or at least it seems that way. In actuality, there's only about 34 rounds. When they removed the whole machine gun, the ammunition storage went up. The rounds are stowed, as you can see, everywhere. There is uh, one, two, three, four, there's five on the rear turret wall. Uh, there are two beside me. There is four on the floor next to them. Uh, in the lower rear turret, they're stowed. And you'll, you'll see also that they're stowed um, nose to tail as they're stowed vertically. Uh, so the base of one round is on top of the projectile of another round and so on. And they do that because the rounds are tapered so you can fit more into the small space. Uh, the downside with this though is that it actually makes manipulating rounds a little bit harder because there's no, there's no one uh, muscle memory, shall we say, that the loader learns in order to get around in the tube faster. Still, it's not, well, I'm not going to say it's all that bad. There is, of course, he's standing on the platform which rotates, so he doesn't have to worry too much about uh, 
where his feet are going, especially given he doesn't actually have much room to work with. The breech is on one side and there's ammunition on the other. But if he does grab around, you can see how long this is. It has to come back over the turret ring to get into the breech where it can then be shoved in. And uh, because I'm not sure if these rounds actually work well with this breech, I'm not gonna slam it all the way in. The gun, the D10, already mentioned this particular version is a D10S. Stabilization was vertical. Uh, later on, there was two axis stabilization added to 55 series tanks. In fact, if you go on even further, then you also have the Bastion anti-tank missile, which could be launched from upgraded versions of the T-55. Although, I'm not entirely sure where you put it. Let me put this out of the way again. Stay. As you look to the front, you can see here the coaxial machine gun, the, it was an SG, now it's a PKT. Feeds up from the right, comes down, and the spent casings are collected in a canvas bag underneath the gun. He has excellent access to the front hull ammunition. There's, uh, there's about 15 rounds, 16 rounds directly to my front here. Uh, they're stowed, locked in place by a very simple lever system. Bring them out, no problem, as long as the turret is facing forward. He does have a periscope, it is rotatable, it is adjustable in elevation. It gives the loader a fairly good field of vision when he's uh, closed hatch. We do have another of these handles here. There, there's, there seems to be one for every station. There's one for the commander, there's one for the gunner I mentioned already, and there's this thing. And honestly, I still haven't figured out what it's for. Well, maybe somebody will write down in the comments. Maybe a, an old T-55 crewman would be able to help me out on this. My cameraman had just made an observation when I was mentioning about this handle here earlier. Um, he used the term, uh, I believe some people call it the oh crap handle. Uh, some people also know it as the Jesus handle. Uh, I mentioned earlier how this tank lurches around and if you look for the, uh, the Type 59 360 virtually inside a tank video, you can see my face practically plants against the camera which is mounted on the, uh, the machine gun up top. So I suspect that this could be used uh, to, for grip as the vehicle is bouncing around. That doesn't explain the handles over on the gunner's side or TC side though because they just have so much more around them. Uh, and in fairness, the TC doesn't have any room to bounce anyway. Just looking very briefly at the breech, uh, it is a horizontally sliding breech block operating handle. It's here, you lift up to swing it around. Uh, it is unfortunately a bit of a bathroom. <coughs> it is a little bit annoying to get back into place. Uh, there is an internal travel lock. A uh, simple cotter pin comes up here, intersects with the lock on the roof. Dome light. <laughs> Nothing else of uh, immediate note. That's it for the turret of the T-55. Now we'll try the driver's hole. So I've come into the driver's position and I've been in worse, but not by much. Uh, the seat does raise or lower. The back is a very simple system. You can adjust the angle of recline. So as I'm currently sitting, with my head behind the hatch, or if it's having slightly more reclined than most. But then, hey, I've got long legs. When the hatch is closed, there's simply a, a rubber pad up top, nothing, uh, nothing to interfere. To see out, he has two, yes, two periscopes. One straight forward and one angled slightly off to the right. For night driving, it would be possible to remove one of the periscopes, replace it with an infrared. Uh, underneath, he's got a little compass. Um, and you wonder, well, how, how can you have a compass in a big metal thing? Well, I look up boat compasses, I guess. So the pedals on the left, you have the clutch. It's a fairly heavy one. The middle one is the brake. And to apply the parking brake, there's a very simple ratchet lever here. Parking brake applied. Parking brake released. And finally, of course, the accelerator. 
Of interest, you can see that the, all the controls, they're, they're mechanical levers or rods that as you manipulate the various controls, you can see them moving. Steering is conducted by use of the two tillers, one on each side. Uh, it is an epicyclic gearing system for saw uh, appearance with the KV-13, not for the ISs, and Russian tanks have generally had it ever since. It won't neutral steer, but the nice thing about it is that it does keep power going to both tracks as you go around the corner. Transmission itself is a five speed with one in reverse. Uh, the shift pattern is kind of odd. The first is back center, two is left near, uh, three is forward left, Four is all the way to the right and forward and five is all the way to the right and back with uh, reserve, reverse, forward, center. Not entirely sure why. Speedometer is located to its left in a position where actually you can see it with your driving head out. The instrument panel, however, you cannot see as you're driving head out, but it does have your various required items. So looking at the driver's panel, uh, I believe that's the start button over here. Uh, no idea what went there. Looks like the tachometer, uh, oil pressure, temperature, presumably for the engine and uh, transmission, ammeter. Uh, up top we have old-fashioned fuses. Master power is located uh, just off to the camera right. Master power is the traditional Soviet design. On, off. He has uh, a dome light. Other controls uh, to his left are the controls for the compressed air starter system. The bottles are actually on the sidewall, not forward. It looks like there is a fuel tank uh, forward of the ammunition. Um, I guess you would count it as extra armor. There are other tanks that have a similar philosophy. We use the fuel as armor. Uh, rather the fuel burns than the ammunition blows up. I guess I'm kind of glad it was never assigned to a T-55 unit simply because I don't fit in them. Uh, but uh, you can't condemn a vehicle for requiring short people if you have short people in the army that you can use them. Uh, although it does perhaps limit your talent pool a little bit. Uh, on the other hand, it's a little bit cozy for effective uh, combat. It, it's not bad. It's Everything seems to be well laid, laid out, but you don't want to be fighting this for an incredibly long period of time, I wouldn't think. Very lurchy vehicle to drive. Uh, it, it's sort of World War II technology brought to its ultimate extent. And, and again, people will forget that this is a very, very old tank. And uh, if they're expecting modern standards of comfort and uh, ride quality, uh, they'll be in for a disappointment. Uh, so you can't really knock the T-55 for that. Anyway, that's uh, about it for in here, I think. We'll head out and close up. The T-55 is probably one of the most ubiquitous tanks in the world. Well, there's a couple of reasons for this. Firstly, they just built a whole heck of a lot of them. It's the most mass-produced tank ever. And not the most mass-produced armored vehicle that honor goes to the Universal Carrier series. The other reason is because, well, I call this the tank version of Top Gear's Toyota Hilux. You can't kill it. Uh, if you have basic mechanical skills, if you understand suck, squeeze, bang, blow, you can probably keep this thing running. So as a result, in places that have limited technical support capabilities, particularly, let's say, in Africa or some parts of Asia, you can keep this thing running. Basic toolkit, you know what you're doing, it's still viable. Now, by today's standard, yeah, T-55 is not what it used to be. And uh, it's frequently looked down upon as nothing but cannon fodder for today's Abrams, Leopards, and so on. This is true, but it's also a little bit uh, unfair considering this is basically a World War II tank that is still in service today. It may not be the best tank on the battlefield, but if you're able to get one to the fight and your opponent has a Kalashnikov, it's gonna be good enough. Another example of the chassis versatility is the simply insane amount of variants that were based upon it. There were bridge layers, heavy armor personnel carriers, uh, firefighting vehicles, you name it, they built it. The other point to note is how many countries built the thing. It was licensed produced in China as uh, a variant of the Type 59 uh, of the WZ-120. 
Uh, other countries, Romanians did a variant of it. it it's absolutely an iconic vehicle, which uh, you have to respect. Anyway, that was the T55. Hope you enjoyed the tour and we'll see you on the next one.